Hello, and welcome to Point Counterpoint Counterpoint, a production of the Lion Newspaper and Lions Township Television. I'm Lars Lonroth, the moderator of this discussion today. And this, on this show, we bring two of the writers, usually three of the writers, of the Lion Newspaper's Point Counterpoint Counterpoint into the studio to talk about some of the most pressing issues of today. So on this installation, we have art director, Pilar Valdez, and we also have Greg Smith, the managing editor at the Lion Newspaper. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Lars. Thanks for having us. So, just to kind of start things off, let's kind of establish your guys' position. What is it that you believe about the topic of socialism, which is the discussion of today, mm -hmm. and most particularly the social, uh, socialist est programs that a lot of people are calling for the creation of? So, Pilar, can you start us off? Yeah, so I'm a democratic socialist, so I'm in favor of socialism in terms of offering programs such as health care and education that the government pays for um, to the people. And that's my basic position in support of socialism. How about you, Greg? So I'm against the government controlling the means of production and providing most, uh, you know, social, well, so a social safety net is okay, but anything beyond that where it's sort of becoming a welfare state, I'm against that. And uh, let's kind of go to that a little bit because uh, in your article that you wrote for The Lion, um, mm -hmm. one of the main points you brought up is about how when the government steps in to assess, assist people, a lot of times that can kind of disincentivize innovation and kind of hold back the economy a little bit. Yeah, can you so speak to that? Really basically, uh, I know of a teacher here at LT who does a quiz on socialism and what they say is when they're handing it back, oh, so all of your scores are now 75% because, well, Joe here you know, didn't study at all, but Sally got 100. So I just took Joe's 50 and added it to Sally's 100 and then divided them both. The thing is, when you apply that to the economy, there's going to be no more points to go around because no one's going to want to work because they realize that they're going to get the same grade whether they study or not. So basically, if you take away the incentive to be creative and to be productive with your resources and your time, you're not going to want to create as much wealth. Um, I think that a lot of the way that people talk about socialism today is kind of mislabeled. People say that the Nordic countries are socialist when really they have capitalist free market economies that fund their taxes from those industries, fund their generous welfare programs. So socialism is really more government control of a planned economy where sort of what people call democratic socialism is really just more of, you know, a lot of welfare spending funded by high taxes. And, and is the latter something that you're more okay with? Um, yeah, I'm definitely more okay with it. I still think it's a bad idea, but it's not as destructive to the economy as government control of the actual planned economy would be. And so, Pilar, you are coming from not really a, a totally socialist position. Yeah, not a pure socialist. You, you're kind of more of the latter, a democratic yeah. socialist. Yeah, for sure. And speaking to Greg's point, as far as like people lose the incentive to work and stuff like that, and bringing up like the quiz that some teacher does, yeah, yeah. I think it's important to note that in democratic socialism, it's not like the government completely taking over and doling out money evenly to every person, like what happened for that quiz. It's more like if you're gaining an obscene amount of money that you just don't need, like at that point when you're making so much money that you have so much excess that like you really don't need, it's taxing those people and saying, okay, this money is going to go towards other people, helping them with their health care and with their education. And I think that public funding of education, if anything, increases people's incentive to work harder. Because when you have a good education, like as far as you said with like imagination and like creativity and stuff like that, I think a good education and funding that through the government would, if anything, promote that. And I think that's, I mean, certain services need to be provided by the government. Roads, defense, education is one that we could or we could have more choice of public and private schools still funded by the government. But I think that it's not really good to discriminate based on rich and poor. So how are, if I'm really rich, why do I have not as much of a right to my own money and my own wealth and the fruits of my own labor? Why do I have less of a right to that than someone who doesn't have as much as me? And I think that charity is a good thing. Really, 
charity, when you talk about it in like a religious, biblical context, it's what I own really is owned by God, so I owe it to God through giving it to other people. But when the government mandates that, first of all, it just doesn't mean anything. And also, it's just discriminating against those people who have worked hard. And, and so what do you mean choices. by it doesn't mean anything? It doesn't mean anything because there's no choice. Like if I'm giving to the poor, it's actually my choice to do that. But if the government taxes me and gives the money to the poor, there's no choice in that. So ultimately, your position is a little bit more about it should be the person's prerogative to yeah. take that action. And their communities and religious communities do a good job of helping poor people out. And I don't think it, that it should be primarily the government's job. I think that, yeah. How do you feel about that, Pilar? What is your thoughts on kind of having it be um, the person's prerogative and have it less of a government mental thing? Yeah, um, I think it's important to realize that at any time in any of our lives, like we could end up, like we're always like one check, paycheck away from being homeless or being in a position where um, like you just don't have the means to support yourself. And Greg bringing up like a religious aspect, well, the number one rule in Catholicism is treat others as you would like to be treated. And if I were in a position where I weren't able to pay for my health care bills because they were just so outrageously high, I would like to know that other people are going to say, okay, I'll help her. Because at some point, they could end up in the exact same situation. So I don't really think that it's like targeting the rich because at any point in time, any of us could strike luck and be just as rich as them or any of us could just come on some hard times and be poor. So there's I, some, yeah. there are rats to riches stories, but there's also riches to rats. Yeah, exactly. How do you feel about that, Greg? Uh, so, I mean, I definitely see where you're coming from on that, but I think there's a couple things wrong with that. The first one is that I don't think uh, it's all based on luck. There's definitely things people can do, and it's not completely out of your hands. Also, uh, socialism is not charity. Socialism is saying, it's being charitable with other people's money, which is basically saying, oh, well, you guys should do this, but I'm not really willing to myself. And that's really empty, and it doesn't really, it's just a really bad way of doing things, because you're also going to be way less efficient spending other people's money than spending your own. Um, and I think that if you were in a time of trouble, I would hope that you could count on your friends and family to help you out, and it wouldn't really be the government's job to, to do that. So I think that that kind of goes to a little bit uh, of a broader thing about this kind of debate is what, is what are we really debating? Is it a debate about the merits of socialism itself or is it more of a debate about whether or not our economy should, or uh, our government should go more towards a democratic socialist model, more like what we see in Europe? It, can you guys talk a little bit about that? What do you think the real um, debate is here? I yeah, I'm the first to admit that socialism in its purest form doesn't work. Like, yeah. it just doesn't. It's true. It's the same with communism. Like, it just doesn't work. But democratic socialism, which is like socialism modified, does work. Like Greg brought up earlier with Nordic countries, like that is working and those countries are prospering. And so I just think that capitalism in its purest form also doesn't work because I, it's so important to remember that capitalism isn't a form of government. It's a system of economics. And so if you're treating a country of people like all they are is just money and different people making different amounts of money like it's a business, I just think that that's like morally wrong. And you're also, a big part of your argument is that um, when you focus on the economic system, it can kind of hold back the government from doing what in your eyes is its job, is stepping in and helping people who may be down on their lot. Yeah. Interesting. And so how, how do you feel about that kind of argument? What, what is your thoughts on that? I think that the biggest, uh, the biggest thing in this debate is just when it comes down to it, it's the role of government. I think that the role of government is to ensure that I can enjoy what I've worked for in my own private property and do what I want with it, and you can enjoy what you have and without anyone else interfering. There's a quote by Milton Friedman. It's the fundamental value is not to do good to others whether they want you to or not. It is not to do good to others as you see their good. It is not to force them to do good. As I see it, the fundamental value in relations among people is to respect the dignity and individuality of fellow men. To treat your fellow man not as an object to be manipulated for your purpose, but to treat him as a person with his own values and his own rights. A person to be persuaded, not coerced, not forced, not bulldozed, not brainwashed. So I think that that really relates to what you were saying about uh, treating a country as, so, so the economic counterpart to 
democracy and like a democratic republic is I think capitalism because both are based on individual liberty you know capitalism is a voluntary exchange people make voluntary choices based on who they elect uh, so I get what you're saying about how just sort of having a Malthusian view of people where you know if there's too many workers then they'll just die off until wages get high enough to live off of I think that's really terrible and there's a place for everyone in our society and in our economy but I don't think that uh, I don't think that's really the government's job to ensure that everyone has any has a baseline of material wealth yeah I I mean obviously I do but I think it's yeah. also like one of my main things is that capitalism would be awesome if everyone started off on equal footing but the fact of the matter is is especially in the United States is people are some people are at a systematic disadvantage if you live in certain areas you don't have as good of access to good education as like we do living in this area so it's harder for them to make this money and then be able to prosper in a capitalist society and so what I'm arguing for and what I'm saying is that the government should first of all break down those systematic barriers that hold people back because it's unfair and yeah life isn't fair but I don't think it's right to say, okay, well, you were born in this place, so sorry, you're gonna live the rest of your life poor. That's not fair, because that is luck. Like, where you're born, that's just what, how it happens. And I just don't think that that's in any way right or fair or morally just at all to say that, sorry, you have to work your way out of this. Because sometimes, no matter how hard people work, they're at a systematic disadvantage. They're never going to be able to get themselves out of that position. So I think that uh, when you talk about how people are at a systematic disadvantage, I definitely agree with that and I can feel for that, but it's not, when socialism tries to redistribute wealth or choose winners and losers, it's putting the people, it's creating another artificial disadvantage and advantage. And also the American dream isn't to become phenomenally rich. It's to make a decent living and not have anyone telling you what you need to do and what you need to believe and just live your own life with the people who you choose to associate yourself with and find some meaning in that. And that meaning is different for everyone and that's sort of the beauty of America. It's not meant to be you have to do this or you have to think this and you can't do anything else. Also, so there was, uh, I'm trying to think, I'm blanking on who it was, but somebody came out with it was just a few ways that you can basically ensure that you'll never be poor. One of them was graduate high school. The next one was don't do drugs. The other one was don't have kids before you're married. And uh, one was find the highest level of education that you can and the highest paying job. And don't quit a job until you have another one lined up. And that drew all kinds of controversy. But I think that's sort of just a good formula. It's something that everyone used to do, but now fewer people do it. I think that that's a good thing to advocate for, for sort of eradicating poverty, but it's not really the government's job to give this wealth that they think that rich people don't need. That's just kind of immoral because it's saying that because these people have more, they're discriminated against and they have no right to their money, when really they have every right to their money. They worked for it and they have it. So, and most wealth in America is not inherited. How it's do you feel traded. about that, yeah. Pilar? Do you think that um, well, for me, I think that there's a difference between the wealthy and the extremely wealthy. Because at the end of the day, people that have that much money, like, they just don't need it. Like, that's true. Like, what are you going to do with that much money? And at that point, like, I just don't see how they could have any problem with being taxed a little bit more to help other people. And what you were saying, yeah. the fact that you brought up of, like, five ways to make sure you're never poor that's great but also again it comes down to like the system that we live in because it's hard for people to graduate high school when their high school doesn't receive funding from the state and so they have bad teachers and poor school supplies and it's hard for people to receive like the highest level of education they can 
if they can't even get through high school because of that. And it's hard for them to keep a job if they're racially or otherwise discriminated against in that job. And so there's so many other factors that if they weren't there, that would be an awesome plan. But they are. So so I think one of the things that you said that I think raised... Can I just respond to what you said? Yeah. yeah so, um, so you said something about how the... What was the first thing you said? Oh, yeah, people just don't need it. I think that that's just a really bad uh, way to look at things because as soon as you start saying that they don't need it and they need it more, then the government is picking winners and losers and it's just discriminating against people who they like more. But that's and they what have capitalism more is for doing. No, the free market cuts against discrimination. There have been multiple studies about how cab drivers, just even black cab drivers, will be more reluctant to pick up black passengers, but in rideshare companies, they're much less discrimination because the only thing that the free market cares about is green. That's the only color it cares about. It's not going to decide not to pick up these passengers and not go into these neighborhoods when there's good money in these neighborhoods that the cabbies aren't taking advantage of. But also, in, uh, if, if what about the, the black cab drivers? Like, Wouldn't it be in their economic incentive well, to do what, that? What I'm yeah. saying is, no, uh, not really, because if none of the other cabbies okay. are doing it, they don't really have to compete for those customers. So. Um, like, like the cab system was a monopoly, but now that you have this, like everyone is for themselves in these rideshare companies and it's completely divided up, it's not centralized, it's just everyone, because if you, if someone else doesn't want to pick up this guy and I really want the money, I'm going to pick him up no matter what color his skin is. And that, there was, Thomas Sewell was talking about this a little bit in his book, Discrimination and Disparities, uh, and he was talking about how it's, he has different levels of discrimination, there's, um, I'm going to label them wrong, but one of them, um, so it's like 1A, 1B, or something, and one of them was just overt racism, which is wrong. Another one was um, actual preference towards one, but then another one was when there's not individual data available, you go by group data. And that's something that's, like Uber provides individual data with ratings of riders and, because uh, the drivers review the riders too. Mm -hmm. So you have individual data on each rider that you can see before you pick them up. So when there's individual data, that really cuts against discrimination, whereas when you have group data without the presence of individual data, which is what the cabbies had, then people, even the black cab drivers, were more reluctant to pick up. So kind passengers. of what you're saying is that when there is all this competition, there's not that ability to really discriminate. Because yeah, you're because someone else is just going to pick up the money. Yeah. What do you think about that, Pilar? I just think that that's like one very, very, very specific example. And yes, that is true in that case with Uber and Lyft and all of these different rideshare companies, that's true. But the discrimination I'm talking about is systematic. So it's like, so it's give me not a, saying like, like some one person. It's systematic. So it's like, it's not like one person is saying, oh, I don't want to pick up this person because they're, they're black or something like that. It's the entire system of capitalism is working against those people because they don't have the same opportunities to get on equal footing as everyone else. That's what I'm trying to say, is because that's, it's true. Like, if capitalism well, so, uh, yeah, is having, having less money doesn't get you as far. I mean, I agree with that. I, if I was Bill Gates, I like, wouldn't be in school. I would have just dropped out. But the thing is, like, besides having money, what else is there that doesn't, that puts people behind the eight ball? Well, to make that money, you need to have a good education. Um, and they, which, like I've said multiple times, is it's systematic. And so there are, it's segregation, essentially. It's racial segregation. Inner city schools in Chicago are mostly Hispanic or black, and they have terrible teachers, well, yeah, to put I, I it mean, nicely. The real estate industry until like the 1980s had all these zones, especially in Chicago. It's probably like the worst city. Yeah, the, it's the, the most country. segregated yeah, city yeah, yeah. in like the United but, States. Um, and yeah, I agree with that. But like areas with less money will have less resources. But what's to stop one of those kids from, like there's plenty of resources out there like on the internet. I, I know that like it's, but like those kids, so sure, they might not go to college, but they can still have a productive career in the trades. And then their kids can go to college eventually. But what I'm saying is like the American dream is not to go from nothing to everything because that's really not possible and very few people do that. It's to be able to just work hard and know what hard work is like and just find some sort of meaning with your life without, yeah. Yeah, sorry. No, no, you're fine. I just think that there's so many people that like 
work hard. Okay, there's so many people that are working hard, but they fall upon being sick and they have to go through chemotherapy and their health care bills are so outrageously high that they just can't pay for them. And so they can't sustain themselves and they have kids and other people that depend on them. How are you saying that that is yeah, in any way I, like I agree. okay? Yeah, there should be a social safety net. And I think that like it, people can be helped if they're in bad times, but I don't think it's good for there to be like the Democratic Socialists of America advocate universal income of X amount of money and health care for everyone. That's just not good. The point of a social safety net should be for people to get off of it, not to live on the dole. So you kind of so. raise something that I think we should kind of talk about a little yeah. bit, which is that you guys both kind of do have some agreement here about yeah. the fact that there does need to be some form of social safety net. And yeah. you just said that the reason uh, that the situ circumstance that that's really understandable is to kind of, the purpose of that is to br give them the tools to climb up the ladder, but not be like on the ladder forever. Exactly. Kind of be that yeah. social equalizer, being that way to get but up But they there. have to, it should be to, with the goal in mind of regaining people's independence, because it's just, it's not good for the government to be taking people's money and giving it to other people forever, and it's not good for those people, because if someone's never independent, they never have any dignity, and they never, you know, have anything that's their own. And owning something and working for something is something that's really good for people. So what do you think that the role of the social safety net should be? What does that kind of, in your ideal eyes, manifest themselves as? Yeah, I agree. I don't think it's something that people should be on for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. It is something that's temporary, but it's something that should be there, and it should be increased more than what it is in the United States currently. And especially in healthcare. Uh, and I think it should be completely changed, but I mean, I think like we might disagree about how to do that, but I think there's certain, it should be reallocated in some areas. Like I'm not familiar with welfare reform very much, but I know that social security is a huge disaster. Our generation's gonna yeah. be playing for the last generation and we're not gonna get anything. Just because of like the Well, and they borrowed population. from the trust and it never grew, yeah. And so, um, but so what do you think about, I think this debate about welfare, like we have more common ground here really than the rest of the debate. Uh, what do you think about healthcare and like going to a healthcare system like Canada? I think that Canada's, well, um, sorry, healthcare system is extremely productive. And I think that that's like a very good form of healthcare. And we were speak talking about this in Spanish class today. Part, like, healthcare has become so just like monetized and it's kind of disgusting. Like, you know how there's that lawsuit against EpiPen now? Sure, yeah. That like an EpiPen costs like whatever, like $5 to make, but they're, they're making people pay like hundreds of dollars to buy them. Like, how is that right in any way? Like, yeah, that person worked hard to develop the EpiPen, but it's just not right if someone's life depends on this thing, but they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So I think that people don't really know that much about Canada's healthcare system. Um, and I know Steven Crowder's not that popular. Maybe I know that you might have never have really taken him seriously, but he, he's from Canada and he has done a bunch of stuff where he goes and tries to get a doctor's visit. So sometimes you have to wait like seven months to see a specialist. Uh, people routinely die and lose limbs due to you know bad practice and having to wait too long. Um, one time he's trying to get an appointment with his friend in one of the government health clinics and it took him like two days and one of the days he was waiting there for like eight hours and it was just ridiculous. So I think that you were talking about how you don't think communism works, how it takes away all the incentive for people to be productive and you know provide good if quality competitive products. Uh, it definitely does that if the government takes charge of any industry. Yeah, especially well, communism is different than socialized. Yeah, well, if you're socialized healthcare, so the government's paying for your healthcare and the government pays doctors and also if the government's paying doctors, they're not going to pay doctors as much as the private sector would pay them, right? Yeah. So if I'm you know, a genius, do I want to be a doctor when I can be a banker or a computer programmer and make four times as much money? No, because I want to make money with my skills. So you're not going to have as skilled people becoming doctors. And then your medical professionals that you do have are not going to provide as good of a service because they know that this is the only place for people to go. They have to come here and it's the money's gonna come in no matter what from the government and we're not gonna provide a good service, we're not gonna be productive with our time or our resources or other people's time and their resources. 
I think really at the core of this argument, like the biggest thing we disagree about is the importance that money should play in people's lives. Because for me, what you said about that, about doctors, like people not wanting to become a doctor because they won't make as much money, no, because if I'm a doctor, well, I'm if I have to pay for my own people. medical school, if I have to pay for my own medical school, I'm not going to go into all won't kinds have of debt. To, because under so, like there, the government will be paying for it. Well, I'll still be paying for my medical medical school, my taxes, or my parents will, and you will, and Lars will. Exactly. Everyone's going to pay and for I it. And I think you'd be a good doctor, Greg. Yeah, so I'm totally is, fine with paying extra taxes. But the thing is, okay, under Obamacare, under, under Obamacare right now, also so in a socialized healthcare system in Canada, I forgot to say, you also have to pay for most of your healthcare coverage unless you're basically. Uh, unemployed and have never been employed. So you, pretty much everyone has to still pay for their like drugs, doctor's visits, but uh, the administrative costs are much higher when the government runs it, obviously, because they have no incentive to streamline it. And that, all that money is just lost to the government. And, so, yes. and, and we can talk about this for yeah. ages. Yeah, and the, so, the role of money thing. Let, um, go ahead. Yeah, so I think that money is... It's something that sort of is, ideally, doesn't discriminate. Some, so sometimes this does not produce the socially optimal outcome. I'll agree with that. Um, I think drugs are a good example because drugs, they like, make you not able to think rationally. In the, you know, whatever. If you're a heroin addict, you're only going to buy heroin. You're not going to buy food. But money is something that it, people are attached to it, and people don't want to lose too much of it because they know that it has a lot of potential. But when, they, when it comes down to it, most people don't get their meaning from money. Like as much as you see it in the movies and stuff, it's not as if everyone knows that money is everything because you can never interact with money. Some people chase it too much, everyone's different, but money is a thing that creates incentives for people to do certain things and not do other things based on accumulating and not losing I money. I think the incentive shouldn't be making money. The incentive should be helping other people and being a good person. Well, we can talk about this issue for hours and hours and hours on end, but eventually the show has to come to a close. So if you two have any last things you want to put on the table, this is that time. So I think uh, I agree with what you said about helping other people, but I just don't think it's a good thing to say. If Lars and I are walking down the street and I see a homeless guy, uh, socialism wouldn't be me giving him a buck. It would be, hey, Lars, give him a buck. So. Helping people is sort of a loaded word when it comes to socialism because you're not really helping them with your own resources. You're trying to help them with what other people have and what people who have more than you have and what you think that they should do with their money. And it really is tyranny. When you put democratic in front of it, it doesn't really change the fact that you're coercing them into doing something that they shouldn't have to do with their own money. So, how do you want to? At end the end this? of the day, socialism, yes, it's a form of government, but it's a mentality. It's a mentality of saying, I want to help everyone else in this country because I believe that everyone else should have the same opportunities that I have. Whether it be because they don't have those opportunities because they fell on hard times or because they were just, they systematically like don't have the same opportunities as everyone else. Socialism is not tyranny if the people change their mindsets. If everyone's just focused on making money and getting as much money as they can, yeah, you'll think that you're being robbed when you have to pay extra taxes. But if you change your mindset to say, I want to help other people and I want to be a good person, then it's not tyranny. Well, hey, thank you both so much for joining us. This is it for Point, Counterpoint, Counterpoint, or in this case, Point, Counterpoint. Thank you very much, Pilar, for joining us. Thank you very Thanks, much, Greg, for joining us. Yeah. And hey, you can read both of these people's articles on the Lion Newspaper's website, lionnewspaper.com, right? Dot yeah. com. Dot com. So be sure to watch, look at all the stuff we have to offer at the Lion Newspaper. And if you're September here at LT, September 21st, we have our first Lion Newspaper issue. Thank you guys so much for coming with us. Yeah, yeah thank thanks, you, Lars. Thanks, Pilar. <laughs>